Let's go back to John 14 one more time today, shall we? This time, I want to zero in mainly on verse 23, John 14. Let's look at the verse 23. Let me just back up a few verses uh, to 21. Jesus says this, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and of me. I will love him. And notice this, and I will manifest myself to him. You want to know the reality of Jesus' presence? Here's the, the formula, if you could call it that. And then look at down at verse 23. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. My father will love him. And we, that is the father and the son, we will come unto him and make our abode, our home, our dwelling place with him. I titled our thoughts for this afternoon, Many Mansions for God. And the mansions are not the places that Jesus has gone to prepare for us, but the mansions for God are our own hearts. Our own hearts are the mansions that I want to talk about. Now, go back to verse 2 just quickly and note what he says there. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Listen. It is God's will to make his home with human beings. That God wants to come to us. That God wants to be one of us. That God wants to possess a human body like ours. That he wants a human nature to me, that is astounding. But also, as we read in verse 23, he, God, wants to make his home inside of us, inside of you. To me, that is incredible, incredibly mind-boggling. And it's something that we ought to celebrate. God wants to make his home in me in my heart when you really pause to think about that wouldn't you agree that that has to be an indescribable privilege that god would make his own our hearts that he would make a mansion out of our soul notice the verse verse 23 it says if a man and, of course, that would include women. This is just a generic term that the Bible is using for humanity. And uh, to, to put it in a different way, any person, anyone, this privilege of your heart being a mansion and abode of God is a privilege for absolutely any person. And I would remind you, that the word mansions in verse 2 and abode in verse 23 are the same word. And so God is willing to make the believer's heart or the believer's soul his mansion. I was meditating upon that, and it, it, it just blows you away when you think about it. And all he's asking, he's simply asking for you and me to cooperate with him to make you a mansion that he can be at home in, that he can live in. That's what we want to think about. We want to look at that declaration, unpack it, and then see how this becomes a reality in our life. So let's do so first by praying. Our Lord, we thank you for just the time that we have to meditate on this verse today. Oh God, I pray that you would give us understanding like we've never had before. And even more important that as a result of that, we'd say yes to you and that we would experience you dwelling in us, your presence in our own lives and in our gathering here in such a real sense, it would be just overwhelming to us. 
We thank you for such a promise as this. Lord, you are a God that is so near. You are willing to be partner with us. And I just pray that today you'd enable the truth of this verse to be clear and uh, to be impactful in every single person's life here, young or old, or to do your work as only you can. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. And I was remembering when I said that, and what servant you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So let's look at this declaration. And we're going to have time to talk about this as a group in a moment. But look at the declaration that he gives to us in that uh, 23rd verse. First of all, he says, uh, my father will love him and will come to him and make his abode with him. Let's think about that for a moment. Who is Jesus's father? that he's talking about here. He is the infinite creator. It is the infinite creator himself that is asking for room in your heart, his creature, his creation. He wants to become a welcome resident in your soul, just as an incredible loving father in a home. Now, I know that not a whole lot of us had loving fathers, right? I think I did. You know, I remember what, what some of the last words my dad said uh, before he went to be with the Lord. He said, I just wish I was able to express my love to you and to uh, your sisters better than I did. You know, it was that generation where they, they just couldn't express their love uh, like the next ones uh, perhaps were able to. But anyway, that, that was one of his regrets. But I still think that overall my dad was a loving father in our home, even though he may not have been able to verbalize it as freely as perhaps we can. I don't know. You may not have had a loving father in your home, or you may have. But put that aside and just think, what's, your, what, what's the greatest example of a loving father that would come to your mind? Well, God is so much more than we can even imagine. And he is the one. This father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the one that says, you know what? I want your soul to be my permanent dwelling place. I want to take up residence in you forever. And I want that residence to be, I don't want to be a stranger in your heart, in your soul. I, I, want, to, I want to be intimate with you. I want to be your closest, dearest family member. That's the father that's speaking this. And notice what he says again in verse 23 about the father. He'll love you. The father will love him. That's what it says in verse 23. But you know what kind of love that is? The love that the father will love the believer in whose heart he lives, in whose heart he makes his home, his mansion. It's the love that is identical with the love that the father has for Jesus. Can you imagine that? He wants to love you to the same degree that he loves his son, the Lord Jesus. You know, that God would pity us seems to me to be enough. But that he wants to love us with a love that is equal to his love for his one and only son is absolutely incomprehensible to me. But listen to this. This is the, the 17th chapter and the 23rd verse and we're listening in. We're eavesdropping on Jesus' prayer as our great high priest. Listen what Jesus prays to his father. He said, Father, I in them, thou in me, that we may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me and hast loved them 
as thou hast loved me. There it is. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is praying that the world might realize that the Father loves me, you, believers, in whose heart he makes a mansion out of, that he loves us to the same degree, identically with the way he loves his son, Jesus. That's the energy of this dwelling. And then also look again at verse 23. As we think about the father, the father will love him. And it says in verse 23, we will come. We will come to him. Uh, we, more than one. It's not just the father. It's more than one. It's the father who makes you his mansion, who makes your soul his mansion in and with and through the Son, the Lord Jesus, and by the Holy Spirit. So really what you have here, who comes to live in you? The triune God, the three in one. That's what we're to get from this. That, again, it's just beyond our imagination. Your heart becomes the mansion for the entire triune God. Now, doesn't that give even deeper meaning to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19? What? Don't you know? No, you not. That your body is the temple of of the Holy Spirit. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're indwelt by the Son. You're indwelt by the Father. The great three in one, the triune God, makes your soul his mansion, his abiding place. What does it say about the Son regarding our soul being many mansions for God? Drop back to verse 21 a moment. Here's what Jesus himself says. He that hath my commandments keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And listen to what Jesus says. And I will love him. Not only loved by the father, but we're loved by the spirit or, or by the son himself. I will love him. He says in verse 21. And you know how he proves that love? Oh, we could say Calvary, but this is in the context, his proof of loving us, his people, is by him totally possessing us. It's revealed by his total possession of us. You see, when Jesus moves into your soul, he does so in order to take total possession of your being. He wants to be in control, spirit, soul, and body of your whole person. That's how he expresses and reveals, I will love him, his love for you. The enormity of that love. It's, it's just, it's amazing love to have his presence within our soul. Jesus is also called the creator he is the possessor of heaven and earth. He is the one in which this whole creation is sustained by. And he's not satisfied with anything less than residing, not in the manger in Bethlehem, not in that house that he grew up in, in the, the village of Nazareth. He's only satisfied by taking up residence in our old, cold, and often faint heart. You know how Paul puts it in Galatians 4.19? He says that he is just constrained until Christ himself be formed in you. Did you know that there is a formation process going on in you? Like a baby forming in a mother's womb? Paul says, I prevail. I'm in labor. I have labor pains until Christ is, is formed in you. That's exactly 
what uh, he's saying, I will love him. And he does so by being formed in you and taking control of every part of you. Look at verse 21 again, because then he says, not only will I love him, I will manifest myself to him. Has Jesus ever manifested himself to you? Has the living Christ manifested himself to you? Has he revealed himself? I mean, the reality of his presence, not just the head knowledge he lives in me, but have you had Jesus manifest himself in a spiritual way? I'm not talking about a vision, but in a spiritual way. Has Jesus ever manifested himself? He says, I'll do that. He that uh, loveth me keeps my commandments. He says, I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. That there will be a moment in the believer's life when Jesus, who always with you, reveals himself personally to you, his presence, his spiritual presence to you, and you become conscious, you have a conscious feeling of his nearness that sweeps over your entire being and fills you with him. Have you ever had that experience? That's what he's talking about here. I will manifest myself to them. I'm telling you, if you've ever had that happen, you'll never get over it. And you'll want more of Jesus manifesting himself to you. That's the reality of his presence. You say, where, else, where is that else in the New Testament? Listen to this. Paul says to the Roman church, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And that is the, the manifest presence of God himself fill, sweeping over you and filling you up with himself. The reality of his presence. And I think that's also what Paul meant when he said uh, down in the 29th verse, when I come, I'm going to come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. It's the reality of the manifest presence of God in the believer's soul in our life. It's really our responsibility to depend upon the power of God indwelling us. You know, there is a difference between the work that you or I can do by our natural resources, our natural talents and abilities. And sometimes we think we have better uh, talent and ability than we really do. Right? We're, we're in our heart, we may not even boast verbally, but in our heart we think we, we can do this. We, that's not what this is talking about. It's depending upon the power of the indwelling God to work something that you could never do based upon your natural resources, but that can only be achieved when you recognize what's impossible to you to do is possible with God because he's come to live in you and he wants to live his life through you. It's coming to the place where you realize, I can't do that, but he can and I'm going to depend upon him to do that through me. Because if I do so, I can do all that God wants me to do through him that infuses his power, his life in me. It is not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And so I'm not depending upon my natural intellect, talents, abilities. But I'm looking to him to fill me and to enable me and to empower me to do what is beyond my ability. It's an impossibility to me, but it's a possibility for God. This is what it means when he says in that 23rd verse, we will come unto him, we'll make our abode with him. Now, in closing, and then we'll have time for discussion. <clears throat> In closing, there are two simple conditions. There are two conditions for you or I as believers to experience the reality of God's presence in us. What I've described, what I've been talking about. How does that happen? What are the conditions to experience the reality of the living Christ in me? You ready? Look at verse 
21 again. First of all, he says, he that loveth me. He that loveth me. So the first condition is you must have a love for Christ. You must have a love for Christ. But it's not a human love. It's a divine love. How do you have that love? Well, 1 John 4, 7 says, love is of God. It's God produced. It's not humanly worked up. It's not human produced. It's God. Love is of God. And then we read on in that fourth chapter of 1 John that we love him because he first loved us. That means that the love that we have for him is reflected from us because we, first of all, received it from him. You know, every morning when I get up, I go down to the living room and... Uh, uh, that's my time where I read my Bible. But one of the things that I, I do routinely is I go around and I open up all of the blinds and all of the curtains because I want the sunshine to come in as much as possible through the windows of uh, the, the, the living room, the house. What we're talking about here is that you open up the windows of your soul and bathe in the sunshine of God's love. That's what it means. We love him because he first loved us. That you, lo you let the love of God like sunshine wash over you and bathe you in the warmth of his love for you. Our love for Christ is based upon our receiving, first of all, his great love for us. We love him because he first loved us. It's his love that uh, swamps our heart. So we open the windows of our heart and let the love of God, like sunshine, bathe our heart. And then we open, I, I always do this too. I open the back door and I open the front door of our house. And uh, we have storm doors and there's windows from the top to the bottom because I want as much light in that house as I possibly can have. So I open the doors and let the light come in both doors as well. <laughs> there is that opening of the door of your heart to then let out the love of God that he has bathed your soul with. Open the door. Let it out and let it up. To him. You said, what are you talking about? The love of God hath been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. When you open the windows of your heart and, and bask in, the, in the, the love of God in your heart, it fills your heart and it, it'll burst if you don't open the doors and then let that out to God, and of course, secondarily to others, but we're talking about God here. A love for Christ is the first condition of him being real and present in your life. And the wonderful fact is God always produces in you what he wants from you. He wants love for Christ, and he's the one that produces that love for Christ in you. If you will open your heart to him, and if you will let him. He'll give you everything you need to meet the condition. Love for Christ. That's condition number one. If you want Jesus to be real in your life, if you want to experience his real presence, if you want him to be more than just a, a, uh, uh, an intellectual, theological uh, person in your mind, if you want him to be real in your daily life, love for Christ. And the second and final condition is also in that 21st verse, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Love for Christ, condition number one. Obedience to Christ, condition number two. Obedience to Christ. He that hath my commandments, that is, that values God's commandments deep in their heart and in their thinking and keepeth them. 
each time that I dare to step out in simple dependence upon Jesus to do whatever he asked me to do, you know what happens? It is God that worketh in me both to will and to do of his good of his good pleasure. Each time I step out to depend upon him to simply do whatever he wants me to do, his power kicks in and enables me to do whatever he asks me to do. And when I do that, a sweet sense of God's indwelling presence floods my heart and fills me with his with a sense of the presence of God. This is what it means when he says in that 23rd verse, we will come unto him and we will make our abode with him. This is what it means that God will make your soul, your heart, a mansion for him, for himself, to live in his home. 